Welcome everyone to Moxie Bets presented by Caesar Sportsbook. Coming up on today's show, Aaron Judge made history last night when he hit his 62nd home run of the season. We'll get into that historic moment. Plus, we'll give you our biggest over and under reactions from week four and give you some picks for week five. And you know it, you got some Mox Locks coming your way. But first, let's welcome in my friend and our guest, sports and betting analyst for MSG Networks, the betting exchange and odds with ends, as well as the host of the No Catch Up podcast, Sean Little. Sean, welcome to the show. Thanks for coming on. My girl, Katie Mox, man. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. You're killing it. I love everything you're doing, Sports Line, the pod. I'm very, very happy to be here to talk shop with you. Thank you. I know it's been a long time. We used to talk at least weekly. So Sean and I, a little bit of background. We did content together for The Juice, which is a social media account powered by Wave TV. And so that's how we met. And then we both worked together at MSG. And we used to talk gambling pretty much every single week. And I haven't had a chance to talk shop with you in a while. So I'm pretty excited to get into it. Yeah, me too. Thanks for having me. Let's, let's, Let's do this. Okay, well, let's get started with the mock thought. Aaron Judge hit his 62nd home run of the season to break Roger Maris's AL home record set in 1961. What do you think of this? I'm I kind of don't care. I I feel like they've been breaking news every five (laughs) seconds to like get into this. They're, you know, cutting into college football a little bit here. I'm happy for him. I think it's great. I do think it's lame that there's a lot of people on Twitter who say it's not a real record and have to bring up Barry Bonds and everyone else and that the MLB doesn't separate the juiced records versus the real ones. Let the guy have it. I'm over watching it at this point, but let the guy have it. Yeah, I was kind of shocked at how negative the 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 input, I guess, on the whole race was across the internet, Twitter specifically. And yeah, it's just a fun thing. It's cool. It's still the AL record. I think that gives it a little more juice, I guess you could say, since we're talking about people potentially taking steroids and that whole thing. But uh, yeah, it's a cool record. It's cool that he did it with the Yankees. Maris was a Yankee. 61, 61 homers. He hit 62. I was getting a little nervous for him. I will say that. That he was running out of at bats um, very very quickly, and he didn't. I I got to give him some 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 love. He didn't. He wasn't reaching. He wasn't chasing pitches. He let it come to him. He almost felt like he knew he was going to get it, and he he took care of business in the in the first at bat last night. I'm happy for him. Um, yeah, I, I don't really know where I stand on the. Is it the home run record or not? It's 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 not the home run record because in the record well, books not. we know Bonds hit 73 and we know all that whole thing. Um, Depends on who you're talking to, if they want to give credit to the steroid era or not. It all depends. But at the end of the day, it's still the AL record. It's still an insane achievement. We were talking about this offline, me and a a bunch of buddies in the group chat. It has to be the best contract year of all time. I mean, for for you to bet on yourself and go into the year, his 62 homers almost win the Triple Crown is pretty insane. I hope he you, – you liked my tweet yesterday. I said, I hope he asked the Yankees for $500 million, and I'm dead serious <laughs> about that. Well, and I like Aaron Judge too because he's actually from the Bay Area. He grew up just about two hours, um, I think, I believe north of San Francisco. He's a big-time 49ers fan, which I just learned uh, uh, earlier this year, like maybe a couple weeks ago. So I'm, I'm pretty excited. I'm on the Aaron Judge train here. But I'm talking to a guy from Chicago. You know, at Chicago right. Flow is your Instagram name. You yes. are Chicago Breeds Legend. That is your brand. Yeah. So we got to talk about Justin Fields, all right? I, t- I brought him up last week on the show. And, you know, can we really judge Justin Fields off of what we've seen? I'm just going to throw some nuggets at you. They're a little painful. The Bears yeah. are off to one of the worst passing starts in a century. They're 67 pass attempts are the fewest by any team through four games since the 1982 Patriots. Justin Field has a 4.2% interception rate in his career as a starter. He's got a 13.4% sack rate, same time. He's got 471 yards, two touchdowns, four interceptions, a QBR of 26.2. I don't know that this is all his fault, though, but I'd love to hear what your what your take is on Justin Fields. Yeah, it's it's been a tough stretch. They they haven't been throwing the ball very well, and then they haven't been throwing it much at all, period. They don't attempt very many passes. It's a lot of question marks with Chicago. We know the deal. It's a new new coaching staff, new GM, new front office, new offense in Luke Getze. It's a new everything. And he doesn't have a lot of talent around him. He doesn't have a lot of protection. So when you look at it at the end of the day, he doesn't have a lot to go off. And then – when he does make mistakes that are 
quote unquote innocent or he just misses a throw, it gets blown out of proportion because, yep. hey, if you can't make those plays, we're in really big trouble. I think going into the season, for me, it wasn't about the Bears winning games. It wasn't about really even competing. It was about Justin Fields going week to week and improving. And I haven't yep. necessarily seen that at all. He's holding the ball quite a bit. Listen, if you have a bad offensive line and you know that, when a, yeah. when a, when a, when a passing play is called, you need to know where you're going to go with the rock very quickly. And he does not and holds it. And then even when he gets easy throws, he hasn't been 100% accurate on them as well. So, yeah, it's all bad right now in Chicago across the board. Well, you talk about the the protection and the O-line. He's been sacked 16 times already this year. Last year in totality, he was sacked 36 times. We're already at 16 just going into week five. I feel like he doesn't trust his O-line, which he probably shouldn't, which causes him to make more mistakes too. I just feel like, he, you know, Chicago has one of the worst receiver rooms in the NFL right now and one of the worst O-lines. It's hard to judge him on what he can do, but to your point, he's still making some bad decisions, which – is to be expected second year in two, especially when you don't have all the weapons and the protection around you. Yeah, no question. I think he's not trusting what he's seeing. He's not trusting what he's feeling. And he doesn't have a guy that can go make him a play on the edge in Komet, who is still a second year tight end who's not doing anything. Mooney's a really good wide receiver, but he's not a number one. So he doesn't trust what he sees in his reads. He doesn't have a playmaker that he could get the ball to and just have him go do his thing and help him out a bunch. And then the O-line, and he's expecting pressure every single time he drops back. And I think he has to feel when you get a call through the through your helmet on third and eight or nine to run Oof. the ball, it's, yeah. it's, I think it's a little demoralizing. And I, I think that's yeah. one of the things that not many people are talking about. You as a quarterback yeah. obviously want to go out and throw the ball on third and nine. If the coaching staff is – you're at midfield and they're calling a run, it's it's some um, they're blatantly telling you that they don't trust you. So I think it's a lot of question marks. It's hard to judge um, a quarterback with the the pieces that he has around him in the Chicago Bears, yeah. but yeah, it hasn't looked very good. Hasn't looked very good. All right. Well, you got a big divisional matchup coming up this week. Bears at Vikings. The Vikings won the last meeting 31 to 17 versus your Bears. That was week 18 of 2021. But of course, that was with Andy Dalton. Justin Fields did also lose his career start versus the Vikings 17 to 9. That was Monday Night Football in week 15. Justin Jefferson has three 100-yard receiving games and four career games versus the Bears. Bears plus tw plus 260 on the money line versus the Vikings. Vikings minus 335. Spread is seven, favoring the Vikings over under 44. What do you like from this game? Yeah, interesting spot, right? We have the Vikings coming home from London, and typically teams don't play the next week after London. I don't know if that was their decision or how that shook out with the schedule, but they are playing. Oh, They're at home. I've got a nugget for you on that. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Tell yeah. me. Well, I'll wait. I'll wait till you're done and then I'll give you my name. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, typically, you know, teams don't play at home the week after London and the Vikings are I right now the, the number seven seems pretty spot on the Vikings yeah. have, um, have played really well at home. They have all uh, Kirk cousins entire career. And especially since moving into that new building in Minnesota, I don't know how the Bears score any points, man. Like, I, the, the Vikings score a decent amount of points. We're talking 25, 25 and a half at home. It's like top top half of the league. And without, without the Bears, without David Montgomery, without their run game, the Vikings have been giving up a ton of rushing yards. But then yeah. the, the only really real weapon the Bears have is David Montgomery. He's out. Khalil Herbert doesn't do well in pass protection, so they've been trying to swap out a rookie for him as well. It's just... I lean Vikings. I'm, I'm never going to give up the Vikings minus 335 at home on a money line, right? And I think the yeah. 44 number is also really sharp because I think the 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 Bears will end up scoring a few points. But yeah. if I have to pick a pick, I'll take the Vikings minus seven. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll probably agree with you on that one. So I'm going to take the Vikings team total on it under 26 and a half. That's at minus 115 on Caesars and bringing up the London thing. So I read this article on Action Network. So since the NFL introduced international games, I think there's been 60 teams, 55 of them. So 92% of teams who have played in London had a bye week after returning. 
There's yeah. only been five teams since then that have declined because the, the NFL does give you a choice. Do you because it you know the London games are the beginning of the season. Now that the season right. is longer, teams are declining that and opting for one later in the season because there's an extra game. So the Vikings, actually all four teams that are playing in London have declined the after buy, but the Vikings for sure did. And um there's not necessarily a lot of data, right? Because there's only like five teams that have yeah. so far declined after. But the trends per action network after from declining the bye week after London, post London team totals are three and two to the under, and opponent team totals are four and one to the over. This makes a lot of sense. Jet lag, yeah. underprepared. You know, the offenses aren't scoring as much, and the defense aren't able to get as many stops. So when I look at this, the Vikings and the Bears, Bears team total 17 and a half. I don't know that I trust y'all, right? So I know that the, t the opponent team total over is four and one, but I don't know that I trust y'all on that 17 and a half. But I do feel like the Vikings are going to be a little bit jet lagged and not, not as sharp. So I'm going to take them under their team total of 26 and a half. That seems like a lot to me coming off of London. Yeah, I mean, you could even tell there was the story that the Vikings got out there a lot later than the Saints did. And you can even tell yeah. towards the end of that game, they, they seem to slow up and let the Saints yeah. back in the game. The Bears are one and five in their last six away games against the spread. So it's it's a, it's a really interesting spot. So the seven seems spot on. I think the total is really close. I like that you're going with the team total. But if I had to make a pick, I'm probably going to stay away from this game. But I would lay the yeah. seven with Minnesota. Yeah, I feel I feel pretty good about the team total. I feel better about the Saints coming back. I know we're not talking about this game because the Seahawks, their team total, I believe, is 20 and a half. I'm going to take yeah. the over on that. Geno Smith, I mean, we're, we're, we're going to get into overreactions and underreactions. I said that, sure. you know, Geno Smith was an underreaction a while ago. Or excuse me, an overreaction. And turns out I was wrong because he's the most accurate quarterback in the NFL right now. I like yeah. the Seahawks to get over their team total because I do think that that Saints defense is going to be very tired coming into this. But yeah, let's really quick here. on really quick on your on the Chicago Bears and just your team in general. I think I'm a big fan of betting on your team and fading your team. I think this is oh, you have yeah. to separate the love of your team versus trying to make money in a very competitive, tough landscape that the sports betting world is. Like, for example, I think the spot for the Bears when they played the Packers in week two, I was sprinting to the window to take the Packers. This is not a spot against the Vikings coming home from London that I'm that I'm sprinting to get a bet down on the Vikings. You got to pick your right. spots, but don't be afraid right. to fire on your team. You know them the best. If, if you can separate that emotional aspect. I tend to just not bet them. I don't like fading my own team. I mean, I will in certain things, maybe take an under or whatever if I don't think, but I, I have a hard time betting against my team. I'll yeah. probably just lay off it if I don't feel strongly, but I, I never just blindly bet the 49ers and I don't necessarily bet with my heart. I try to find where there's an actual edge where I feel really good about it. So I agree with you. I just don't like betting against my own team, even if it's going to make me money. <laughs> I hear you. I feel you. It's it is tough to do, but... Hey man, I'm just looking for any, wherever the value's at, that's where I'm trying to pick it up. I like it. All right, people, we're brought to you by Caesars Sportsbook, the greatest sports betting app of all time. See, it's not just about the daily promos, odd boosts, or the hundreds of ways to wager. It's about the immortal words of Caesar himself. You bet you get with Caesars Rewards. Every bet you place on the app, no matter the outcome, earns towards exclusive perks at Caesars Rewards destinations everywhere. Hotel stays, concert tickets, bonuses, and more. Download the Caesars Sportsbook app, become a Caesars Rewards member today and get more with every wager. Must be 21 or older to gamble. Gambling problem? Call or text 1-800-522-4700. Now we're going to talk some over and under reactions to week four. Let's start with the overreaction. What do you think right now is an overreaction in the NFL for week four? That Russell Wilson just stinks. I think overall, <laughs> the, that's the kind of the 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 mantra and what people have been screaming out oh. that, you know, is, is Russell Wilson good anymore? I think he has a lot of stuff going on. He has, everything is new. We got a new city, new coach, new offense, new teammates. Uh, he has to deal. Uh, this, this might sound like I'm joking, but I think he also has to deal with like keeping up that perfect human persona that he tries to bring. Oh, yeah. Before. And I think Which people that don't like. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, yeah. It's, I mean, he, he, I don't, it'd be tough for him to switch up now, but, <laughs> but yeah. I think it's all, all that stuff goes together. And I think that is a, a key to, you know, why they got off to a little bit of a slow start. And um, he played his best game of the year uh, last week in yeah. Las Vegas against the Raiders. Yeah. He played really, really well, was efficient. 
they um the defense on the ground was getting gashed and that's that's a big key on why they they gave up 30 plus points and lost but the 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 whole russell wilson narrative of him not being good anymore uh, is a complete pure overreaction you don't have to like the dude but he's still a top 10 quarterback for me I, I tend to agree with you. I faded him last week. I took him under his one and a half passing touchdowns. And then, of course, he gets two uh, for the first time of the season. I think it was unfair of the NFL to put him in Seattle for his first game back. That's a lot of emotions. Yeah. That's a lot of confusion. You know, your first game with a different team and you're back in Seattle. And then the fans booing him and stuff. So that game aside, and, you know, he, he had all those drops in the end zone and the fumbles that weren't necessarily his fault. I do think that they should have won that game. And then against the 49ers, he looked really really bad but i mean what have we seen from these niners and uh and that yeah. in that front seven <laughs> yeah. i mean they are just yeah. nasty absolutely yeah. nasty so he did look better last week that offense did start clicking so yes but i think the public opinion of russell wilson has just taken such a dark turn everybody used to love him let russ cook and now the memes and i think it's yeah his personality is trying to be this perfect person and trying yeah. to be a leader on the new team it doesn't seem like his teammates like him that much but also i think once you start winning everything changes and so we'll see how he does this week my overreaction is that the cowboys should stick with cooper rush all right i keep seeing all these things about <laughs> oh now cooper there's a clutch. quarterback con yeah like come on a quarterback controversy <laughs> in dallas like cooper rush has been balling all right i don't want to take anything away from him but he also beat teams that are combined six and six. Like, let's see how he does against the Rams and the Eagles and those defenses before we start saying that there's any kind of real quarterback, you know, challenge in Dallas. When Dak, when Dak Prescott comes back, it's going to be Dak. Like, I, I see no reason to have Cooper Rush starting these games. Yeah, I 100% agree. I will say this, similar to what you said, I in three games that he's played, I haven't seen Cooper Rush miss a read or a throw yet. He's played extremely well. He They haven't played anybody very tough. Like we talked about it, they they played a, a Bengals team that was struggling at the time. Then they played, who's much improved now. I love what they did against the oh. Dolphins. And then we'll see what yep. they do coming in this week. Then they played the Giants on Monday night where he was very efficient, didn't do anything crazy, but but what very was very clean, got the ball out quickly. And then they beat a commander's team who potentially could be the worst team in the NFL. That's how bad <laughs> they are. So uh, I would I would look to see, you know, pipe down on the Cooper Rush and Cooper Rush is this, Cooper Rush is that. It's funny though, man, when you start winning, no matter who it is and, and you yeah. look good, people people tend to forget about how good Dak is. Remember how Dak got his got his job as well. Like he's yeah. seen this movie. I think that's partly why you keep hearing that, yeah, Dak's coming back, Dak's rushing back. He doesn't want, you know, to what 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 he did to Tony Romo to happen to him. Oh, no, absolutely not. And the thing is, is the, the game that Dak Prescott did play, they didn't have a touchdown. They were the only team in the NFL not to get a touchdown. And we know yeah. he got injured, but that wasn't until late until the fourth quarter. So you look at that performance versus what Cooper Rush is doing, but we can't underrate the defense for Dallas right now. Micah Parsons yeah, is an absolute beast. Yeah, and that's so funny because we always talk about the Cowboys is like, oh, Jerry Jones never invests in his defense. He just likes to pay, you know, the flashy offensive guys, but uh, that's, that's changed. And uh, Dallas is looking mean up front. So let's actually talk yeah. now about some under reactions. Who's excited? excuses are you not buying sean whose excuses i am not buying the 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 rams i think the rams are very ah. bad how like people are underplaying how bad stafford and the rams overall are the, the, yeah. they, they can't move they can't run the ball they can't push the ball downfield stafford ranks 25th in air yards over 15 yards everything is underneath Ooh. they can't run the ball the the best offensive unit offensive line unit last year was the rams by quite a wide margin this yeah. year, it's quite the opposite. They're nowhere near as good as they were last year. And last year, when they were the best in the league, Stafford was turning the ball over. So now you taper that offensive line play down yep. a bit, and he's continued to turn it up, turn it over at that at the rate that he's doing. I think the Rams are potentially in a tough, tough, tough stretch for the rest of the year if they continue to not be able to run the ball. You can't run the ball. I mean, you can't not run the ball, have no balance on offense, and then not go over the top as well. You have to pick one or the other. You're either going to sling it and try to push it downfield or 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 not and you can't they you can't do both. And hey, it could be Stafford's dealing with elbow injuries. It could be a lot of different stuff, but right now it's being underplayed at how bad they are on offense. 
Yeah, and that offensive line too. I mean, the Niners got to him six times uh, just on Monday night football. And I think people are still riding high off of last year, but that's a team that went for broke, that spent everything they could to get that Super Bowl at home. And you're seeing the after effects of that because they couldn't afford to keep a lot of those players. They're really thin. They lack a lot of depth. And yep. even they, they've got more receivers than, you know, than Cooper Cup, yet he only throws to Cooper Cup. And yeah, I mean, yeah. we got, so, who is it? Um, Gibbons or uh, uh, what's his name? Who is the guy that he threw to? No. Oh, we're talking about Higby? Higby, yeah. Higby. Yeah. He threw to Higby, uh, you know, in Monday Night Football. But for the most part, he only throws to those two guys. So I think he's got to open it up a little bit more. And, yeah, I mean, it's, I'm not high in the Rams. But I will say the Rams are still the favorite to win the NFC uh, West right now. I believe they're at minus 120. The Niners are at plus 100. The Niners have what is perceived to be the fourth easiest schedule down the stretch here. So this might be the last time you could get the Niners to win the NFC West at plus money. Just throwing it out yeah. there in case you at even money. Yeah, that's, yeah I, I'm not mad at that play at all. Alan, also really quick nugget on – we were talking about Higby and Cup. Alan Robinson, I think, ranks at the at, – he's either last – or almost dead last at uh, separation for wide receivers. He's just not separation wow. percentage uh, versus cornerbacks. Yeah, Allen Robinson's not getting any separation from guys. It's hard to get the ball and get looks when you when you don't look open, especially at yeah. that rate. And you know, it just they just they just got worse, and it's being underplayed. Their their offensive line is worse. They're, they swapped yeah. Robinson for uh, Odell, and that's not working. And then you can't run the ball even at all. So, yeah, the Rams are, are, what about, are in trouble on offense right now. What about Jalen Ramsey, who got cooked? He's been <laughs> cooked pretty much. All. You sent me that, man. It was the funniest thing in the world. And, yeah. uh, you know, it was Debo Samuel making a joke out of it. And I, I saw yeah. I saw a piece – or I saw a meme that he was like a burnt piece of toast at a, uh, a press conference. I mean, Jalen Ramsey, what happened to that guy too? He's fallen off so far. He's, it, by the it's way, it wasn't very... even the Niners who cooked him. Yeah, it's a very interesting situation, right? Because he does seem to get exposed quite a bit. When he's either he's it's either feast or famine. He's either locking somebody up, making a game win and play like he did it, uh, in the Falcons game to close that out, or he's getting or he's getting smoked. But then when you ask the players who's the best corner in the league, <laughs> they all lean Jalen Ramsey. So it's a very polarizing situation because he's also they've got very like recency boisterous. bias of several years. I think they're not looking at the first four games yeah. of the season. Yeah, yeah, no, it it could be, and he yeah, he's having a, a tough time against the most elite guys, but he he touts himself as the most elite. So yeah, you got to lock those guys up as well. Yeah. All right. Well, my underreaction is that the Ravens are choking away the AFC North. So Baltimore, in my opinion, should be four and zero. They should be four and zero after four weeks, but instead they're two and two. They blew huge leads in the fourth quarter, and they did it at home to boot, which is even worse. And for as well as Lamar has played, he's also stunk up the joint a little bit too. He threw two fourth quarter interceptions. Harbaugh's play calling also has been a little bit suspect to me. I know that we're all tired of people not going for it on fourth down, but that decision there to go for it on fourth and goal in the second yard line to tie, I, I kind of just feel like they should have kicked it there and they got out coached by a million when we look at what the Bills did, driving it down and then going and waiting, not giving the ball back. But it seems to me right now they're in a three-way tie for the lead in the AFC North. The Bengals are starting to heat up. You mentioned that earlier. I don't know. I don't know about the Ravens right now. Yeah, they. if you go back and look at some of the passing yardage and just total yardage they've given up to start the season, it's very eye-opening. Their pass defense has been getting exposed on a week-to-week -week basis. Uh, they're making big mistakes, like you mentioned, with Lamar in fourth quarter interceptions towards the end of the game. They got shut out in the second half. Their second halves of this first half, this first quarter of the season, have been brutal. Very, very, very poor. They got shut out uh, the last week against um, the Bills. We know what happened against the Dolphins. So, yeah, I, I think um, stay tuned. I was down on the Ravens coming in. They played a lot better on offense than I thought they would. They have to clean it up on D and, and uh, see what they'll – see what they can do moving forward. But, yeah, the Bengals are coming on. That that division, they don't have to worry about the Steelers, but the Bengals and Cleveland are there. Absolutely. And I do think that from a betting perspective, you just said it, they've been falling apart in the in the second half and in the fourth quarter. So if we're going to if you're going to bet the Ravens, maybe just look into them for first half bets, because the second half is when they start to employ implode. Uh, Lamar Jackson also on a contract year similar to Aaron Judge. But even yeah. though he's been playing well, when you throw, you know, two interceptions in the fourth quarter and lose the game, 
that's when it starts getting risky that he turned down the money. Yeah, I I think that, you know, he might have had a bad a bad stretch and a bad spell uh this fourth quarter, but I think overall he's been playing sensational. So it's hard to it's I, I don't I won't hold him to that fourth quarter uh, against probably the best team in the league, at least the best team in the league for me. Yeah, so, the bells, yeah. yeah it, it, it was a it was a tough fourth quarter, but I think Lamar will be fine. I think he'll end up getting the money that he wants if it's this year, if it's next year. Um, so yeah. Guaranteed. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's gonna get it regardless. I think he's shown that he can throw it and can he's just so versatile. He is a very He's first of all, he's a very loved guy, which doesn't get enough credit because that all that stuff matters. Everyone likes him. Everyone wants to play with him. He's himself. And then on top of that, he produces with not a lot around him. Yeah, true. Time now for Capper's Corner. Let's preview tomorrow's TNF matchup between the Colts and the Broncos. The 2-2 two and two Broncos host the 1-2-1 one, and one Colts on Thursday Night Football with both teams lacking horsepower after making big trades for quarterbacks Russell Wilson and Matt Ryan. Colts are coming off of a 24-17 loss versus the Titans. They were four-point home favorites there. They suffered two massive injuries. Jonathan Taylor, high ankle. He's day-to-day. And then Shaq Leonard, he's out with a concussion. That was a big blow to them because he had just come back. Broncos, we talked about it earlier. They're coming off that 32-23 loss versus the Raiders. Russell Wilson with a season high, 124.9 passer rating, two touchdowns, zero interceptions. Colts plus 158 versus the Broncos, minus 190 on the money line spread. Three and a half favoring the Broncos. They're favored here, over under 43 and a half. What are your three best bets for this one? Yeah, yeah, I am looking at, this is one I'm actually, have been looking at since last night, is Russell Wilson over 19 and a half completions. I saw it at minus 125 and went to 130. Now it's at 135. I even saw it at 20 and a half over at another shop if you jump around but i think this is very interesting russell wilson's coming off his best game of the year last week against the las vegas raiders javante williams blows his knee out get well soon but that's one of their that's their best running back by quite a bit and then you have this melvin gordon situation where he has four fumbles already to start the year they've been running a rookie mike boone who got some touches in the last game i think he'll continue to get some uh some touches as well i'll get into that in my second pick but i think they're gonna throw it a lot more than expected the colts defense run defense in particularly is very very stout i like russell yeah. to go over 19 and a half completions in this one i was gonna piggyback off of that although kind of slightly in an opposite direction um sure. but I'll, I'll 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 well i was gonna let you get, go through all your picks but basically i'm taking russell wilson over his rush yards which is kind of interesting. It's at minus 101. So to your point, he's starting to feel himself a little more. He threw for two touchdown passes, and he rushed for 29 yards in the last game. It's the most of the season. And like you said, the Colts have been very stingy against the run, only allowing 77 yeah. yards per game. No Javante Williams. He's out. Melvin Gordon, you just touch on it. He drops everything that he touches, four fumbles in four <laughs> games. I yeah. feel like Wilson's going to be scrambling a little bit more because he can't necessarily trust the run game as much. So I like what you're saying, but I'm also going to take him over his brush prop. Yeah, I think, well, listen, if, if we could both hit on that because the more pass attempts, the more opportunities to scramble. So hopefully if he's not completing passes, then he's getting on the outside and picking up a few extra yards to go over your number as well. My, yeah, uh, my right, second well pick. I was going to say, I cut you off. Keep going with your with your picks here. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no worries. Melvin Gordon, under 51 and a half, minus 110. I think this number's okay. actually creeped. Yeah, it's, I think this number's actually creeped up a few yards. I think it's at 53 and a half. But I still like it at 51 and a half. I don't think he's going to get the touches that warrant this number. And the Colts defense is very stout up front, like I was alluding to. Fumbling is probably the biggest problem you could have for a running back or any particular player yes. because then it comes down to a trust issue. They don't want to give yeah. you the ball. And you know, no. you've seen Belichick over the years. You fumble once, you might not play for two weeks. So You're the out, fact yeah. that he's been fumbling at the rate that he has been with, I think he only had four or five carries last week and he fumbled one. So I think Mike Boone, the rookie, is going to get quite a few uh, few looks. So yeah. I like this number. I like this to go under 51 and a half. Yeah, I think he has um, fumbled in actually five straight games dating back to last season. It's just like you about to lose your job. You know what I mean? Like you just might yeah. not start anymore. Is there any other plays that you're looking for in this one? Yeah. And also becomes a mental thing for Melvin Gordon, which you never want to be worried about holding onto the rock as a running back. No. So yeah, I like that under, uh, 
My final play, I like the first two more than I like this one, but Brandon McManus over six and a half points, minus 125. The The total in this game is uh, 44, I believe, and they're not expecting too, too many points. I think the Broncos team total for touchdowns is one and a half, and it's juiced to the over at minus 175. I think McManus will have some opportunities to kick some field goals, so I'll take over six and a half points at minus 125. Well, I mean, they've just – they've been – doing that the whole time anyway so yeah I agree with that I'm gonna take the under uh, last time I saw it's at 43 and a half it might be 44 in some books it's at minus 110 the under is just the trend here in general the under is 4-0 with the Colts 3-1 and with the Broncos but a lot of that had to do with Vegas scoring a lot Broncos and Colts both rank in the bottom three in points per game this season and they're banged up right now the Colts a league low of 14.3 points per game this season it's the fewest through four games since Peyton Manning's rookie season in 1998 shout out to the Bob Glad he got better than that. Thursday night under is also three and one and eleven and five in the last year. Under this number, this 43 and a half, it's seven and eight combined, and both defenses are playing far better than their offenses are. So feel like the under's the trend here that I'm going to stick with. So I like Russell Wilson on his rush, and then I like the under. And I'm just gonna sprinkle like a random D Gen one in there that like isn't necessarily yeah. my best, most sharpest play. However, I'm taken. The outcome of the first drive for the Colts to be a turnover. This is at plus 525. The Colts are minus six, their turnover margin right now. This season, they were plus 14 last season. They've been outscored 29 points off of turnovers this season. And you look at that defense from the Broncos, they're nasty and they're mean. So at plus 525, I feel like it's worth a, a sprinkle that we might get a turnover for the first drive of the game. Yeah, I mean, Matt Ryan has nine fumbles, four interceptions. He's been absolutely horrendous across the board. The, the, the joke mocks behind me calling him Matthew Thomas Ryan is because me yeah. and you see Eric Coleman, our, our great friend, former Jet Safety, was we were arguing about should he be called Matty Ice or Matt Ryan? And we were arguing about, like, at what point did he deserve this Matty Ice nickname? So now I've been calling him Matthew know. Thomas Ryan. But, yeah, Matthew Thomas <laughs> Ryan has been turning it over at an alarming rate, fumbling, intercepting, interceptions, the whole deal. So, yeah, I'm not mad at that at plus 525. All right, let's go. Okay, so we're going to get into our mox lock. So these are our two to three best bets for week five, all of the games. Give me your first bet that you're locking in this weekend. Yeah, my first bet is Chiefs Raiders over 51. Uh, this game's gone over that number in their last four matchups. We know the Chiefs can score. I'm not worried about that. It's more of the Raiders. So I think I wasn't encouraged with how the Chiefs closed the game last week, last Sunday night against the Bucks. I thought uh, the Bucks got a little bit – I'm actually very encouraged with how the Bucks closed that game. It looked like Brady and, and Mike Evans got on the same page and kind of picked Finally. up that chemistry yeah. where it was previously. I don't. I wasn't encouraged with how the Chiefs D looked to close that game. They took. They they came off the gas. Divisional, familiar. I think this game is in you know the 30s. I like. Uh, I like the over here in this spot. I like that play a lot, and I agree with you. I'm going to take the Dolphins yeah. minus three. This is minus uh, 120 right now. So this line open up at six, favoring Miami, but then the Jets won a game last week, and all of a sudden this is dropped by an entire field goal. That seems a little crazy to me. Of course, Miami didn't look great in TNF, but Tua also left on a stretcher. That's enough that any person – I didn't even want to watch the game anymore. I was upset. I can't even imagine being his actual teammate. Yeah. Plus, they were on a short week. And they were on the road um, and their defense. I mean, they just won that big game against the Bills, but their defense was on the field for a majority of that game. So I feel like they were a little bit gassed. This line to me feels like an overreaction and don't tell EC Eric Coleman to the Jets who barely won a game against a TJ Wattless Steelers and Mitch Trubisky and then the rookie quarterback, Kenny Pickett, who did rush for two touchdowns, but uh, he didn't really move the ball all that well for me to be yeah. super impressed. Plus their defense just isn't very good since Eric Coleman left. Hasn't been very good. Their secondary. <laughs> Do we really think that secondary is going to stop Waddle and Hill from just running all over them? I don't. And then you look at Teddy Covers here, Bridgewater, 42-21 against the spread in his career. And on the road, he's 24-6 and six against the spread. Head-to-head -head, Miami has won four in a row, eight times of their last night. Like, give me the Dolphins minus three all day long. I'm fading the Jets here. Yeah, rookie quarterback comes in, turns it over three times. You still struggle to get a W. I'm not sure Zach Wilson's an upgrade over Joe Flacco just yet. So I think that's also a narrative that people are buying into. And yeah, Teddy Bridgewater, the biggest key of what you said was Teddy Bridgewater and how sharp yeah. he looked when he came in. He looked very oh. solid for a very big portion of that game until the Bengals blew it open. He looked like they didn't miss too big of a step, especially with Mike McDaniel and the way he's calling plays down in Miami. Yeah, I like Miami in that spot as well.
Okay, my second lock, I'm going to take that Vikings team total under, which I already talked about. So let's get into your second uh, lock of the week. Yeah, I'm going to go Niners minus six and a half. You know the deal. I don't know how the Panthers are going to score on the San Francisco 49ers. That's it's plain and simple. Baker Mayfield has looked brutal against defenses and front sevens that are way worse than the Niners. I like that. I don't care if I don't care if the game's in Carolina. I don't care if it's at a neutral site. I like the Niners to come in and take care of business on D first. Jimmy G will continue to to get acclimated with the offense that he's already acclimated with. Uh, I yep. I think this this game also closes at seven, maybe even seven and a half. Give me the Niners minus six and a half right now. Yeah, I agree with you and get it under that key number of seven. Like you said, Baker Mayfield has not looked great and that Niners front is just so nasty. And the secondary has improved a lot this year too. They're locking people down much better than they have in recent years. You've got Hufunga, who's just been just a stud. Absolutely love him. What? Yeah, Hufunga has been insane. He's absolutely one of the most feel – he's one of the most – like as a safety, the feel he has for the game is, is insane. Insane. So he's, he's just been great. I think he's ranked like number one, PFF ranked number one right now yeah. for safeties, which is crazy. Nick Bosa leading in a lot of care categories right now. I like him for a defensive player of the year. You said it. I don't know that Carolina scores in this game. The Niners defense has been so good. So I love that, especially under that key number of seven. I'm rocking with you all day on that one. And you got a teaser for us too. talk, talk to me. Yeah. My six point teaser, I'm taking uh, the Packers from eight and a half down to two and a half, and I'm taking the Bucks down to two and a half as well. Give me the Packers in London. I don't really, I'm not taking too, too much uh, stock into what happened the other night against the Patriots. They ended up getting it done. I think they just had a little bit of a lapse. Aaron Rodgers threw a pick six, which he absolutely never does. I think the, the Giants are getting a little too much love e- even with this number being at eight i think this is i think this should be a double digit spot for the packers yeah. i'm teasing it down and combining it with the bucks the bucks are, have been hearing all week how good patrick mahomes is and how their defense got embarrassed and exposed i'll take them coming off a loss where yep. a, a, a a sell high spot on the falcons who i've actually been on the last couple of weeks they've been playing really well i'm going to take the bucks Falcons going to Tampa. Tom is going through all the off-field stuff. I think they're going to be completely locked in. They looked a lot better on O to close the game. I think I'm, by the end of the week, I'm, I'm almost positive I'll be on the, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers minus eight, minus nine as a single play as well. But I definitely like it in this teaser. I love this teaser, getting them both under three. And I believe that Tom Brady has never lost to the Falcons. So that's definitely not going to start now. Sean, thank you so much for coming on the show today. You can catch him on MSG Networks Monday through Thursday on the Betting Exchange and Fridays, Odds with Ends, and of course on the No Catch Up podcast. Sean, let people know where to find you on social. Yeah, everything is at Chicago Flow. That's my, that's the moniker. Sean Little at Chicago Flow. Give me a follow. I always engage. All right. I love it. All right, guys, this has been Moxie Bets presented by Caesar Sportsbook. Don't forget to follow us on social as well at Moxie Bets. We'll see you next time.